Hey guys, in this video, Tim is going to be taking you through central government under Elizabeth. You need this for your GCSE history. Now, for all of the dates and people and what they did that you need to remember in this to help you remember all of this, over my website there is a whole set of multiple choice questions just waiting for you. England during the reign of Elizabeth was very different to the England of today. Most importantly, it was much smaller. Scotland was not under the control of the English throne. It was not yet the United Kingdom. The border with Scotland was usually disputed and often much further south than it is today. Added to this, the island of Ireland was also not predominantly under English control, although sporadic and often failed attempts to control the island would be made throughout Elizabeth's reign. It was much smaller than today around 2.5 million, compared with somewhere around 56 million today. The population was less urban, fewer people lived in towns and cities, and much more agricultural. There were more uninhabited areas and wildernesses, vast forests dotted with small villages. There were towns and very rarely cities, but even these differed from what we would expect today. During the reign of Elizabeth, for example, Norwich was the second largest city in England, whereas today it is Birmingham. Unlike in the modern age, the writ and authority of the government had to be forcibly enforced, especially in remote areas such as the North and Wales. The United Kingdom today is a constitutional monarchy. The role of the monarch in government is ceremonial and advisory, and they take little to no active part in the actual politics and running of the nation. This was very different in the Elizabethan age where the monarch was the central key figure of the government and the personification of the government herself. In many ways, this made the government of England a personal monarchy, dominated by Elizabeth, her family and her friends and courtiers. A key concept during the era, and indeed for many hundreds of years, was the divine right of kings, which officially gave the monarch the status of a demigod. Their decisions were automatically correct, and their right to rule stemmed from God and was therefore automatic and unchallengeable. Elizabeth therefore had complete control over England and its citizens, from big issues such as wars and foreign policy, right down to the minutiae of everyday life, such as what clothes people could wear and what they were allowed to eat. All the laws that pass through Parliament require the consent of the monarch. While this is theoretically still the case today, custom and practice means that the monarch automatically signs legislation by Parliament. In Elizabeth's day, that was actually required and not automatically guaranteed. In theory, under the constitution such as existed, the monarch could not herself pass laws. This required the consent of parliament, but she could issue what were known as royal proclamations, which completely bypassed the need for parliament in its entirety. The monarch could, even with all this power and even with the divine right of kings, be brought to court. The monarch was not above the law something which later monarchs would have to be forcibly reminded of. The issue did not rear its head, however, during Elizabeth's reign. Like today, Parliament was, in the Elizabethan age, central to politics and government in England. Also like today, it was bicameral, meaning it was divided into two houses, an upper house, which was unelected, known as the House of Lords, and a lower house, which was elected, known as the House of Commons, terms which we continue to use to this day. The House of Lords consisted of the nobles, landed gentry and courtiers, and the higher clergy, officials within the Church of England, such as bishops and archbishops. The House of Commons, in theory, consisted of common people. Unlike modern Parliament, however, there was no Prime Minister, no Cabinet, and no political parties. Parliament was subservient to the monarch, something which would seem odd to us today. Parliament in the Elizabethan era functioned very differently to our modern Parliament. Only the House of Commons was chosen by elections. Universal suffrage was not yet present, so the electorate was very limited. Only those who were male, and indeed were above a certain income every year, could vote. In practice, the effect of this was that seats in the House of Commons were dependent on the gift of local notables and nobles. The relationship between Elizabeth and Parliament was not always a happy one. During the Elizabethan era, the role of Parliament was to deal with complex financial matters, such as government taxation and expenditure. As we've seen, in theory all laws had to go through Parliament, and indeed a total of 438 were passed during the 44 years that Elizabeth reigned. Laws were of two types. They were either public, in which case they applied to everybody, 
are private. They apply to specific people or specific groups of people. This is in stark contrast to today under our system of the rule of law, where the law applies equally and to everybody. As we've seen also, however, royal proclamations did not require the consent or approval of Parliament. Elizabeth made extensive use of these throughout her entire reign to stamp her authority on the country and override a pesky Parliament. In theory, at least, Parliament was also there to represent the people and advise the Queen, as one may expect from an all-powerful monarch with the divine right of kings behind them, Elizabeth had little regard for their advice and usually dismissed it out of hand. Indeed, Elizabeth would only call Parliament 13 times through her reign, and 11 of these were simply to ask for more money. The relationship between Elizabeth and Parliament was therefore dismissive, but it never erupted in violence and was relatively harmonious, especially compared to later centuries. She did not in particular want their advice, but was content for them to carry on being Parliament, and they in turn did not deny her the money she needed, either for exploration or wars or palace renovations. The word court, to some extent, is still in use today. Ambassadors to the United Kingdom in the modern age are usually known as ambassadors to the court of St. James. We can define the word court as the group of nobles, clergy, officials, suitors and various hangers-on that surrounded the Elizabeth and the monarch. They filled key posts, such as advisors, ambassadors to other countries, military leadership and posts in government. The court was not one single physical location. Instead, it travelled to wherever the monarch was. Elizabeth in particular liked to travel, especially around the south of England. She rarely ventured north, and the court would go after her. Being within the inner circle of the Queen in court carried both a risk and a reward. It could result in lucrative and powerful posts, but angering Elizabeth, which was easy to do, could result in imprisonment, punishment, or even execution, usually by beheading. There was a lot of grey areas and overlap between the court of Elizabeth I, the Government of England, Parliament, and the Privy Council. The Privy Council is a term still in use today, and indeed the word privy can be roughly translated into modern usage as private. The term is still used, and senior political figures are regarded as being privy councillors, such as the Prime Minister, senior government ministers, and the leader of the opposition, and they are given the title Right Honourable, signifying that they are indeed members of the Privy Council. In Elizabeth's day, the Privy Council was a small group of senior advisers to the monarch. Their purpose, at least in theory, was to advise Elizabeth and provide a range of differing opinions and options to the monarch on how to deal with important issues of the day, from foreign policy to economics. Due to this purpose, it's often tempting to compare the Privy Council to the modern-day cabinet which surrounds the Prime Minister and the senior ministers, and to an extent this simile works. However, like with Parliament, Elizabeth often completely disregarded the advice of the Privy Council and ruled alone, using the divine right of kings, by which we mean the God-given right of the monarch to rule unchallenged, as her justification for doing this. Also in theory, the Privy Council was supposed to be involved in all matters, military, the security, government, taxation, religion. In reality, however, as one may expect, they could only take decisions with the consent of the monarch, which she was not always prepared to give. As we've already seen, Elizabeth was headstrong and stubborn. Privy councillors were appointed directly by the monarch, so the monarch therefore had complete control over it, a factor that Elizabeth was well aware of and used to her advantage throughout her reign. Favourites of the Queen were promoted to the Privy Council. Throughout her reign, Elizabeth gradually reduced the size of the Privy Council. The one she inherited had about 50 members. By 1597, in the closing years of her reign, it would number 11 people. Initially, the Privy Council met every day. As Elizabeth asserted more and more control and imposed more and more of her personality on government and asserted her right to rule alone, however, they would eventually meet only about three times every week. The legal system, such as it was in Elizabethan England, was very different to what we see today. Many key legal principles simply did not exist, such as the rule of law, which says that everybody is equal before the law and that the law is sovereign, which was not a factor in Elizabeth's age. The right to representation, being provided, if needed, with a solicitor or lawyer to represent you and put forward your point of view, was another key legal principle that simply had not been invented yet. Two key legal factors in a modern and fair legal system, the burden of proof and presumption of innocence, were not there either. These are the ideas that somebody is innocent until proven otherwise. Often, trials during the Elizabethan era were merely show trials. Courts were less professional and less well organised. There was none of the court structure and professionalism that we're used to today. 
The most important court were the great session courts, often known as the Assizes, a term used right through to the 20th century. These were held twice yearly, biannually, in every country, and dealt with the most serious offences. They were famous for their harsh punishments, all the way up to relatively brutal forms of execution. There were lesser courts, such as town courts, manor courts, and petty sessions, which dealt with smaller offences in local areas, like burglary, for example. These were usually presided over and held by local nobles, further stamping the authority of the local landowner or landed gentry on their local area. However, the most wealthy people, especially if they were accused of financial crimes like fraud or usury, were tried in what was known as the Star Chamber, a special court which was presided over mostly by senior privy councillors appointed by Elizabeth. Ouch! This is when somebody is, I've had explained scratches. 